as we come together and journey together in this thing of life, we realize, and particularly as we're trying to uh, look at, uh, and uh, I've loved our being able to share together going through the book of Acts, and it's so impossible to do that in the amount of time that we've had. So we kind of highlight over it. There's Yogi Bear is the one who said, if you don't know where you're going, you have to be careful because you might not get there. <laughs> the journey of life is always a mystery to us, is it not? And as we look at the Apostle Paul, as he goes on this journey through the Mediterranean world, takes the good news of Yeshua of Jesus to his Jewish brethren, and God told him to go to the Gentiles, and he does, but he can't let go of his fellow Jews. And he keeps going to the synagogues and telling them that. On this third missionary journey, which we'll look at just uh, briefly, we find out he travels, this is about close to five years he's on the road. He will, this journey alone will take about uh, 3,000 miles. It's estimated in the antiquity they could walk in a day 15 to maybe 20 miles a day if they had a good weather going in that way. As he goes along the way, the Roman roads, and if it wasn't for the Roman roads, you realize, don't you, there's been one time in world history you could get on a horse in present-day Syria and ride to present-day London safely if you had the right papers under the Roman Empire because they occupied everything. And what the Roman roads were, which they built for moving their troops and commerce to the early Christians, and the printing press was to the Reformation, Luther and Calvin could never say sola scriptura if they didn't have copies of the Bible. And the printing press does that. Technology is today. And we see all the time the things that are incredible, the ability to access God's word and to be able to live and to share it in that way. But Paul, as he moves along the way, he travels and he goes at this fiercely strenuous life. And he does, we've seen in the second tomb, Paul has this habit of going back to the churches he planted, checking in on them, as well as starting new ones. Along the way, there are three different passages where it goes to the first person, and so when we, so when we versus they, who is we? It's Luke. Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke, as well as the book of Acts. He picks him up on the second missionary journey. And when he loses some of his friends, as we saw John, Mark, and Barnabas, because they have a fight over John Mark. And by the way, we saw at the end of his life, he will be some of the most important people. But a big lesson for you and I is the simple truth. Life is attaching and disengaging. Coming together with the people and letting go. And if you and I do not learn that skill of how to actually attach, not just pretend, and when life in the Lord leads to be able to let go, it will tell your heart out. But as we learn to be able to trust the Lord in the things that we have for a while and then let go, to say one of the great learning to be able to do this is not just a good mental health psychological issue. It's deeply theological. It's a statement of faith. It's a statement of faith that you believe that the Lord will guide and provide. And it's also an assurance of pardon of the knucklehead things that you and I do in our life, that God has not only forgiven them, but he's forgotten them, and that he can even redeem and use those things. As we go through this life, we find that out. So as he moves along, he tells them as it goes along, as Luke writes, I must also go to Rome. He wants to get to Rome. He'll get there, we'll find out next week in his last journey, but he'll get there in chains. He wants to go to the heart of the decadent imperial city of Rome. Rome, and talk about a cesspool, will become the greatest city for Christ for centuries. You think of that happened in LA? You think about that? When you think of Tel Aviv, you think of Judaism. When you think of Mecca, you think of Muslims. When you think of L.A., wouldn't that be great to be able to say, when people say, oh, don't go to L.A., it's just filled with Christians, just filled with Christians. And it's possible to take place. Paul came in and changed into Rome where he heard the Colosseum, they're screaming for blood, and the incredible poverty, a third of the city were slaves, and then the 
exorbitant wealth of the others. And Paul says, this will be Christ's city. And it becomes that out of some kind of supernatural, yes, spiritual, not in the way that we think, but in the way that he thinks. And so as you go along in Acts 22, we take a look here. If we have uh, those scriptures up here of the, this passage of where he comes along and he is telling them where he's going to go. Uh, do we have those or? Ah, there it is. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, he, he's part of a little setting. He's telling himself he's going to go before these four different trials. You know, Jesus goes through six different trials, three different ecclesiastical before the Jewish leaders, three civil. Paul is going to now echo up what his master has done, these four different trials. When he goes back and he stands before in Jerusalem, the crowd, and then before the Sanhedrin, he will be thrown into prison in Caesarea for two years. They forget about him. Felix and Festus, two different Roman procurators, he will stand before. But here he's telling them this. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get quickly out of Jerusalem because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was shed, I was standing by and approving and keeping the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, depart, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word, they listened to him, and then they lifted up their voices and said, when he says he's going to the Goyim, to the Gentiles, away with such a fellow man from the earth, he ought not to live. And as they cried out and waved their garments and threw dust into the air, the tribune commanded him to be brought into the barracks. And he ordered him to be examined by scourging. A scourging, great little trick. The Romans would beat you and whip you until you confessed to whatever they're charging you with. To find out why they shouted thus against him. And when they had tied him up with thongs and Paul said to the centurion who was standing by. This, Paul is really good at this. He was an attorney, really good at this. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went to the tribune and said, what are you about to do? This man is a Roman citizen. In other words, he has rights. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune said, I bought my citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, but I was born a citizen. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him instantly, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. But on the morrow, desiring to know the real reason why the Jews accused him, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. Paul, as he's standing there, and they're about to beat him, he says, is it all right for you to beat a Roman citizen? Two reasons, remember, you could be crucified as a Roman citizen, only two. An attempt on the emperor's life or falling asleep on duty. The other one that can get you in really big trouble is beating a Roman citizen without due process. And so Paul waits until he's tied up and he says, uh, do you, tell me, is it okay to beat a Roman citizen around here? And he goes, you're not a citizen. He goes, I absolutely am. And he had the papers to be able to prove that. And so they realize, what are you doing? And so Paul, wherever he gets into these trials, these places, pain is not in itself honoring God. I know a lot of Christians who say it must be godly because it feels so bad. That's not what the Bible says. There are times you and I are, yes, called to go through suffering. And when you and I pray the Lord's Prayer, when we say, Lord, deliver us from evil. Most of us are really meaning, Lord, deliver us from struggle. And God says, no, there's going to be struggles in your life. But Paul doesn't need to needlessly be beaten, go through pain that doesn't achieve what he's about, the mission of Christ. And so he comes and they find him 
to this place, and we find out that God very often will move us in places that we don't intend. Adam and Eve, what? Cast out of the garden. Joseph, sold by his brothers into slavery. The plagues, by the way, the plagues weren't just for Pharaoh to bend the knee. It was to drive the Jews out. And when they're driven out of slavery, remember, they're always going, let's go back to Egypt. God gives Adam and Eve the entire garden. He says, one tree, no eating. And they weren't content in paradise without that one tree. The next time you or I say, if only I had this, I would be happy. Go read Genesis 3. Oh, very often we get so misguided in saying, if only I had that, then I would be content. And Paul will go through this life and to be able to show them what God is really intending to do. It is so hard for us because we love to control life. And life can't be controlled. And we have to decide what are we going to take on this journey? You know, our backpacks are when you go camping, you can't take everything, right? You go, what's necessary? You and I, as we walk through life, there are things we need to be able to say, not this, not this, yes to this. And a lot of those have to do very often with memories. Very often, and God has given you a great brain, and your limbic system, your emotional system, you have a thinking brain and a feeling brain. Your feeling brain is really fast and really sloppy, and it responds that way. Your thinking brain is really slow and really accurate. And when you and I get into conflict very often, you gotta invite your cortex back in the discussion. You have to be able to say, and that's why one of the great things to do as I said, when someone comes up and just blasts you, and I've made a living out of this, is uh, being able to respond, just feedback what they s- said to you the first time. If someone comes up and just attacks you, co-worker, somebody else, somebody in the family, if you just say back to them, so what you're saying is da-da-da, without comment, one, It validates them that you're actually listening. And two, it gives you a chance. And the other great trick to learn, you know, when you're confronting somebody, stare at the bridge of their nose. Because they don't know you're not looking in their eyes. And it's not intimidating to you. Unless you're really close, then you go cross-eyed. So don't do that. But being able to look them in the eye and to be able to feed back. And Paul is learning along the way as he looks them in the eye to tell them the good news of what Christ is doing. And so he will come before them. He's procurators. And our next scripture from the 26 chapters, we jump ahead. Paul gets put into prison. They said to protect him in Caesarea. Uh, Caesarea, by the way, Herod the Great backed Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. And when Mark Anthony went down, he decided he better get along with the new emperor, Augustus. So he built Caesarea in honor of Caesar. And he builds this, and so they have this place. And so they put him, Paul, into prison there. And so he says, Thus he made his defense. Festus said to a loud voice, Paul, you are mad. Your great learning is turning you insane, is what he means. He's telling him about the risen Christ. And Festus goes, you've gone, you've left the reservation. He's not alive. What are you talking about? Paul says, I am not mad, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking the sober truth. But the king knows about these things. And he's talking out about the Jewish king. And to him I speak freely. You got a Roman procurator and a king here. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, you think to make me a Christian? Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but all who hear me this day might come as such as I am, except for these chains. And the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man has done nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, 
This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Paul, well, they have him in prison. He's a Roman citizen, and he says, I appeal to Caesar. You know, all of us in this room, or those of you watching online, you have a right to take a trial to the Supreme Court. Doesn't mean they're going to hear it, but you have a right to appeal to that. And Paul was a hot enough ticket when he said, I appeal to Caesar. They said, to Caesar he goes. And they said he could have been set free if he hadn't done this. Oh, the elders in our session meeting were one night we were studying saying, do you think this was in God's will that he did that? Or do you think he pulled the trigger too fast? And the answer is God knows. But God uses this. And very often as we move through life, we come to these places of where we come along. And before the crowd, the truth of Paul's message is shown. Before the Roman tribunal, the truth of Paul's life is shown. And before the Jewish council, the truth about the, Paul's power will be known. And I want to remind you and I remind myself up here, very often the trials we're going through, God is trying to make us into the image of his son. This is a fallen world. You know you're behind enemy lines, right? This is a tough place to live, this world. There's beautiful things, of course there are. There's wonderful things. But there is evil here. And you and I are picking a fight with evil. And when we do this, why we need to rely upon the Lord and stand by him. But remember this. Sometimes the things you and I go through is not because we've done anything wrong, but because God is using it. And other people are watching. I have one of the missionary and evangelist of ours. He was down in South America, a true story. And he was sharing about Jesus and there was a gathering and some young Marxists got up and were just yelling at him and screaming. And he was just quiet. And they kept yelling and he was just quiet. And they came back the next night and they showed up. And one of the girls there who was yelling at him said, I was so moved by your patience and your confidence. And she gave her life to Christ. And she asked him, what were you doing? And he said, I couldn't think of what to say. And God used that. They didn't know how to respond to it. And God uses the silence to say here. And very often you and I, we don't have to have all the answers to the world. No, we have the answer, Christ. And being able when we go through the things that we have and people watch you and when people bump into you, if we're filled with Christ, the grace of Christ spills into their lap. And that makes a difference. I remember when I gave my life to the Lord, really, when he had called me back from the idiot phase I was going through in adolescence. And I was hanging around a rather salty group of people. And one of my friends, big, but then he was a you know, Chicano guy. And I mean, Bob was a big guy. And he was so hairy, we said he had to shave his hands to eat breakfast. But, and he said, hey, bro, I'm going to go with you to your church thing. This is after I'd given my life to the Christ. And I took him to the service, and the pastor sermon was, on the role of the wives in marriage. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me, Lord. At the end of the service, he went forward and gave his life to Christ. God uses these. Things that you and I don't think he ever could. And being able to see this power, to be able to see how the Lord uses and to come alongside and to trust in that way. And so Paul, before the councils, he stands there, he goes on and he relates to them. And he stands before them. By the way, when he's before the Jewish council in another next chapter, he calls them brothers. And I don't think he's just speaking Jewish brothers. I think he was probably part of the council. If he was, he was married. We have no record of anybody in the Sanhedrin not being married. It wasn't a requirement, but there's no record of any single person. And if that's so, and Luke will record that his nephew will come see him in prison. The way he says, for the sake of Christ, I have lost all things. He means all things. He means his family as well. But I count them as garbage, or I might gain Christ, having a righteousness not of my own, but he's given to me. Paul 
will have fulfilled in his life, not only taking his name before the kings and queens and to the Gentiles, but remember when we read when Ananias, when the Holy Spirit said, he's one of mine and I will show you what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. This is not a sadistic God. This is a redemptive God. I think the Apostle Paul was one of the strongest men physically who ever lived. When you see what he went through, he said three times he received 39 lashes. 40 was a death sentence because very often you died from lack of fluids. Beaten with rods. In prison. He said a float in the sea. And yet, he said, I considering that the present sufferings, and when he said sufferings, he's not talking about a bad hair day are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. It's both to us and through us. And to be able to say, this struggle is worth it. This struggle, not in itself, but because of where God is leading it. And we so get into comparing each other. There have been uh, several different studies. The happiest people in the Olympics are the gold medals, and the bronze medals. You know what the most unhappy? The silver. You think, well, they just came in almost second best. Exactly. They feel what they could have done. The bronze are happy just to have a medal and the gold. And you and I in our lives, when we keep comparing ourselves to others, it gets into such a tangled mess. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, he one time said when he was walking up to his pulpit, someone handed him a note. And a lot of times he'd get a lot of blast letters before he'd get up front, and he opened it up, and all that was written on it was fool. He said, you know, a lot of times I get anonymous criticism, but here I got a signature and no message. <laughs> we have to be able to get to the place to be able to respond and to say, Lord, guide and lead me in this, in this power. Here you got these... Roman procurators, you have King Agrippa, and you have a tent-making Jew down here in chains. You know who has the power? It's Paul. And very often the things with all the throwing dust in the air and all the power in the world and its powers, I'll tell you who has the power. It's that little maid over there cleaning their rooms who knows Christ. It's the person parking the valet, the car, and saying, have a blessed day. What makes the headlines of heaven? Not what you and I read, but God says, come here to his angels. Look at this person. This person is trusting me. Watch what I do with them. It said Alexander, as most warriors, one thing he could not tolerate was cowardice in battle. And the story is told that very often he would come after the battles and he would review those who had been confronted, very often those who were imprisoned on the other side and others. And one man brought in chains and he was a Macedonian as well. And they said, what's his crime? And they said, cowardice in battle. And they thought, he's gone. He is gone. And Alexander stood up and said, what is your name? And he sheepishly said, Alexander. And Alexander slammed the thing and said, you change your name or you change your life. And he let him go. We're Christian. We belong to Christ. And I think the Lord says, Either change your name or change your life. We say that God is the answer, and yet 5% of Christians will share their faith in this coming year. 5%. We say that God is the answer and that we believe in him, and yet the average Christian gives 3% of their income to the work of the Lord. By the way, the world gives 2.8% to charity, just on its own. We say that we believe that Christ in the church is the answer that as Calvin said, you cannot have God as your father if you do not have Christ or the church as your mother. 
And yet now the average regular attender attends church uno once a month. I'm not saying that going to church makes you a Christian any more like they say than living in a garage makes you a Ferrari. It doesn't do. But there is something about us, and that's why I salute so many of you, that faithfully come, not for the brownie points in heaven, but the fellowship and being able to come into worship. And for those of you likewise watching online, those of you that can't get here. And so as we go into this world, we realize, as Paul said, and we'll see next week his final journey as he makes his way and chains to Rome. Not that I am already perfect, my brothers, but one thing I do. Leaving, leaving, leaving what lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press forward toward the goal of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Shall we pray? God Almighty, we thank you that you have given us this gift of being able to have this life. And we thank you, Lord, we did not need to talk you into loving us. Lord, you love us more than we'll ever know. Well, for all eternity, we'll be finding out the measureless love that you have given to us. I thank you, Lord, for my sisters and brothers in this room and for all those in this city that are lifting up the name of your son, God. May we learn how to work together and to reach out and to share the good news of Christ. And so, God, as we go into this world, I pray in our own little journeys until we all stand before you on that day, may you have your way in our life. And we pray this, almighty God, for the glory of his name, the head of the church. Amen.